I'm Mark Kelly and Mr. Saltwater Tank. Come and tell me half of saltwateraquarium.com. What you're about to see is a recording of part one of our new webinar series, Real Life Reefing. During in the webinar series, I combine book smarts with street smarts, sharing with you my experiences of working with countless clients over the years. The webinars take place Sunday night, and after I teach you about the topic, I take your questions live. Now, this week's topic is dosing and supplementation strategies for your reef tank. From dosing pumps to calcium reactors to no dosing or supplementation at all, that's what I'm talking about this Sunday night. And I've got a guest speaker, Terrence Fugazi from Neptune Systems is going to be joining me as well. The webinars cost you nothing, nada, no dollars at all. All you have to do is register and you do that at saltwateraquarium.com slash webinar. Hold tight for the recording of this week's webinar. And if you want to get on the live action, it's happening this Sunday night, April 5th at 8.30 p.m. Central. Remember, you're going to need to register to be part of the webinar, and you can do that at saltwateraquarium.com slash webinar. With that, roll film. I am Mark Callahan, also known as Mr. Saltwater Tank, coming to you tonight to talk about the strategy of saltwater fish selection. And let's go through a little bit of logistics before we get into this tonight, because people are going to ask, first of all, this webinar series meets every Sunday for four weeks at 8.30 p.m. Central Time. No, the whole webinar series is not about fish selection strategy. That's just what I'm talking about tonight. We're going to have other topics uh, that we're going to have throughout the webinar, but it does meet every Sunday for the next four weeks. Sunday, April 19th is the last one. Recordings will be available. We'll get you more details on that. Um, probably through an email, so, but if you can't make it tonight or you got to duck out early, or if your kids are at home and continue to drive you crazy and you're screaming and you can't hear a thing, you can watch it later. And by the way, this whole series is brought to you by saltwateraquarium.com. I'm in charge of video marketing over there. And one thing that we've done for a long time, which a lot of people don't know about, is there's a 5% military or civil servant, servant, servant discount. So EMTs, first responders, things like that. We have recently extended that out to healthcare workers. So nurses, nurses, doctors, hospital workers, any of you people that work in healthcare industries out there in the front lines dealing with this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. First, thank you for your service. Thank you for what you're doing. We are offering the 5% discount. We're extending it to you. Um, there is a link. Kenneth, if you'll shoot that over to me, I'll post it up for people. Uh, there's a link where you can go to sign up. We just need a picture of your badge or hospital ID to verify that, and then we'll get you in the program. This doesn't extend to map things, certain uh, pieces of equipment like UTEC gear, Neptune gear, things like that have a map program where we can't discount those, but there's plenty of other stuff that we can discount. So thank you all for being out there doing what you're doing, and that is going to extend to you. All right, that being said, Let's jump into this on a Sunday night. I hope you all are doing well. I hope you all are practicing social distancing. I hope you're not going crazy, but this is a great time to stare at your tank, do projects around your tank, dream of your tank, look at your tank and go, hey, what could I do better? What do I wanna do with my tank? So let's do another show of hands here. How many of you are doing things around your tank that you've been putting off or you looked at your tank because we're home more now and you go, you know what, I should do that and you're actually doing that. Let's take a quick poll here. Raise your hand if you're doing things around your tank that you probably wouldn't have done before because you're home more and staring at it more, hopefully enjoying it more. How many of you would like to do things around your tank, but you're putting them off for whatever reason, even though you're home more? And there's some of you that just don't want to answer, which is fine. Hey, look, Trax is here. That's awesome. All right, great. So people are more active with their tanks. Fantastic. We'll talk about other things that you can do with your tanks um, throughout this webinar series. But tonight we're going to talk about fish selection because that's one thing that's easy to do. You can still get fish shipped to your house or you can go by your local fish store. They will bring it out to the curbside if your local fish store is smart and savvy. Um, some local fish stores are still actually open and they're letting people in on a limited basis. So I'm going to talk to you about fish strategy of fish selection tonight. This is one of my favorite talks. I've updated this. One of the things that I want to do in this series is bring to you 
you know, street smarts, things that I found out in, in the world doing things because I'm a hands-on type of person. School for me was okay, but I like to get in there and get my hands dirty and just teach myself by actually doing it. And one of the things I do for people is I build them a tank, but then I don't just disappear. After the tank is built, then the real work begins because people want fish and they want coral and they want everything to turn out well because that's how they think it should go. And a lot of times it does. And a lot of that time that happens and it does go well because of a strategy, not just spitballing things, not getting lost in the new thing that's in the fish store that looks shiny and neat, especially when it comes to fish, because I bet one of the reasons you got into saltwater aquariums and not freshwater because saltwater is better. It's because of the pretty fish. Look at this fish here, this clown tang right in the front of the slide. Pretty fish. You don't get that in freshwater. So successful saltwater fish keeping, saltwater, successful saltwater tank keeping is a lot about strategy. So I'm going to talk about the strategy tonight. Now, if you have no clue who I am, welcome to the webinar. This, my name is Mark Callen, Mr. Saltwater Tank. I run a website called MrSaltWaterTank.com and I have a show on YouTube called Mr. Saltwater Tank TV. I'll admit it's not getting a lot of attention these days because I'm spending a lot of time on saltwateraquarium.com's video, which is fine by me because it's a great platform to get information out to you all. And I've written some things, written, done some things in the past, like written some books. These are out of print, but I have done them. If you have them, thank you for your support in the past. And along the way, as I was getting my website set up, getting Mr. Saltwater Tank TV going, now I actually just found out today, I just looked in the books, and uh, just past 10 years old on the show last week, which was pretty cool. Someone came to me once and said, I want you to build me a saltwater tank. And I said, nah, that's not what I really do. And then they asked four more times and I decided I would shut my mouth and start talking to them about building them a saltwater tank. So this is one of the, I think this is the first, yeah, this is the first tank that I got paid to build. This was back in Austin, Texas. For those of you who want to know what lights are over it, this was a 225 gallon tank lit by Ecotech Marine Generation 1 Radions. Even the G1s got the job done, as you can see in this tank. Now, along the way, that thrived, excuse me, this tank did thrive and the job evolved. I started building bigger tanks. This is the 300 gallon tank in wall in the Washington, D.C. area. Put it just as a 215 gallon tank, also in the Washington, D.C. area. Uh, this client, I built him this tank, they loved it. Then they built their dream house. So I got to build them his dream tank, which is this one here, which was a lot of fun. And I also service tanks as well. This is a tank here in Nashville, Tennessee that I service. Um, this one is a real interesting project because it's four feet deep. There's only access from the back and it's acrylic. So to scrape the thing down for coral and algae to remove coral and algae or hard to remove algae from the pain, I have to get in it. Yeah, that's not fun. It sounds fun. It's cool like twice and then you're over it. And along the way, it's evolved as more. This is a tank that I built, geez, two and a half years ago now. I was about to say recently, but that's not that recently anymore. And along the way, though, what I've learned is it's a lot about building the tank for people. But once the tank is built, as I said earlier, that's when their real work begins. Because getting it stocked with fish and with coral requires a lot of strategy and a lot of patience. Fish are a lot harder than coral especially for crewing good animals and picking out your strategy. So that's what I'm talking to you about tonight. Now we talk a lot about corals. I'm willing to bet that everyone on the call, pretty much everyone on this webinar tonight, is into corals. Okay, let's take another poll. How many of you have fish only tanks? Only, just fish only, you do not have a reef tank. Let's see here. How many of you just have fish only tanks? Raise your hands if that's you. Okay, one, one, two. Okay, so a handful. I don't think we're gonna break 10 of you. Uh, maybe we will, okay. The point is, fish get you into the saltwater tank hobby and corals get you addicted. This is my theory on it. Most of you, I'm willing to bet, started with some kind of fish only tank. You didn't put corals in there first. In fact, you might've gone to your local fish store, looked online and looked at a coral and said, I don't get it. It doesn't move. Why would I pay money, especially some of those ridiculous prices that they pay for those little hard corals called SPS, I don't even know what that stands for, but hey, it looks ridiculous. No way I would ever pay that money for a piece of little one inch or half inch piece of coral that doesn't move. Why would you say that? Because you might have seen this movie and that decided then, okay, I'll have a tank or your kids decided they wanted a tank after they saw the movie and you probably had this tank. 
hopefully not that exact tank, but if that was your tank, hey, uh, it takes all type. I would love to have the high resolution photo of that. Um, the 55 gallon tank, I'm willing to bet that most of you have had that tank. It's like everyone seems to have that tank in the, in the hobby. It's like a rite of passage. You probably wanted a clownfish because that was in the movie and it's a very iconic saltwater fish. You probably wanted one of those fish because that was in the movie and they're pretty cool and your kids like it. Hopefully you didn't jump in and buy one of these. This is a red mandarin, by the way. Uh, very cool fish, very picky fish, not easy to keep. Uh, hopefully you did not start with one of those and heaven forbid you started with one of these. The yellow-tailed damsel. You can't kill it, but you can't get it out of your tank and it will likely kill other things that you did like in your tank. So then you decided maybe I should do some research. So you hopped online, you started looking around forums, and you decided that, you know what? Some of these in your tank, the yellow tank, would look really cool. In fact, having multiples of those in your 50 valve gallon tank, even one, okay, you could make do with one if you had to. Putting one or more of those in your 50 gallon tank, 55 gallon tank would be cool. And then these guys showed up, the tang police. And you're like, what the heck did I do wrong? I just wanted to put some tangs in my 55 gallon tank. So then you probably slowed down. Hopefully you slowed down. And then you ask the question that I get all the time. I see it with my clients, I see it online. People ask me this and it drives me crazy. They go, what's the maximum number of fish I can put in my tank? And I always shake my head and just say to myself, how can I say this with any tact? Uh, I wasn't born with necessarily a lot of tact, definitely something that I struggle with with times, but thinking about how many fish, the maximum number of fish you can put in your saltwater tank is absolutely the wrong strategy. In fact, that's no strategy at all, other than let's max it out and jam some stuff in there and just see what happens. In other words, you take this wad and you throw it against the wall and you see what sticks. I cannot stand this question because it puts the wrong context in it. Now, maybe people don't know what they don't know. That's okay if that's you. If you've asked that question, I asked that question too in 1989 when I got into the hobby. That's why you're here to learn a better way to do this thing. So don't think about stocking your tank as a number. In other words, how many maximum fish can you put in there? Think of it as a strategy. This whole talk tonight is about strategy, trying to think, get you to think strategically about what fish you're going to put in your tank. Now, first things first, when it comes to this strategy of saltwater fish selection is, are you need reef safe fish or not reef safe fish? Your fish only guys, not reef safe fish are probably right up your alley. There may be some reef safe fish that you like, but I'm willing to bet, uh, I saw him when I asked the question, nearly everyone on this call, on this webinar tonight has a reef, Therefore, I'm willing to bet you would be upset if you put a fish in your tank and it mowed down your corals, whether it be hard corals, soft corals, whatever. I'm willing to bet you will be upset if you put a fish in there and it mowed it down. So are you, do you need reef safe fish or do you need not reef safe fish? That's the first place to start. It's a very easy question to ask. If you're keeping a reef tank, you need reef safe fish. Now there is some gray area in this. I'm going to talk about that in a bit. So don't worry if you have a reef tank and you had your eye on that non reef safe fish, or that reef safe with caution fish, and you go, I really want it. Now he's telling me I can't have it. Not necessarily. We will get there. Hold your horses. All right. This whole thing, you probably heard of this, the inch per gallon rule. What is it? Well, it goes like this. For every inch of fish that you want to put in your tank, it's going to need three to five gallons of water. The inch per gallon rule. And look, let's be honest about this. People see three to five gallons of water and they go, whatever, that five part, I'm just going to rule that out. I'm going with the three because no one's conservative. Very few people are conservative when it comes to stocking their tank. Okay, so what does that look like? Here's my old 450 gallon tank. Wow, that's an old photo because I'm sitting here right next to where the tank used to be. The room is about to get demoed uh, because I'm adding on to my house. If you missed that, uh, it's on social media. Sorry, I just looked at this and like, wow. That's that's how it used to be. All right, for your first tank, maybe you started with a 450 gallon tank like I did. And you said, all right, I've got a 450 gallon tank. I can do one inch of fish for every three gallons because no one does the five gallons. No one goes with that. Come on, we're Americans, most of us. That means you can have 150 inches worth of fish. You say, this is the best hobby in the world because I can put in about 42 yellow tanks. The tank police be damned, I'm gonna do what I want. Don't tell me what I can do with my saltwater tank. 
This approach is not what you want. This is why I was talking about how many fish can you put in your tank? Do then you lose the, use the inch per gallon rule? No, you don't want 42 yellow tanks in your 450 gallon tank. Okay. Therefore, the inch per gallon rule is just a starting point and it leaves tons of considerations out. It leaves the whole context, the whole strategy of stocking your tank out. I want you all to be better saltwater tank keepers, better reef keepers. Having a strategy with your fish is a great way to do it because this is not what you want. It may look cool. Trust me, you don't want this for many reasons. Okay, let's break down the strategy. Now, grab yourself pencil and paper to write on. I know you have a recording, but there's a lot to go into this. Strategy is a multi-pronged process. There's a fair amount of overlap. First thing I look at is bio load. Then I'm gonna move on to personality. Now I'm gonna dig deeper into all these, so don't worry if I'm not just flowing through it, I'm gonna dig deeper. Then I look at my introduction sequence and I want utility fish, fish that are gonna do things for me. This is where I start with this. So let's dig into this. Bio low. Some fish produce a lot of waste. This is a grouper. For those of you that have fish only tanks, you may have this in your tank. Let me tell you, that's cool. I can't keep it in a reef tank because it would eat anything that can remotely get into its mouth that it thinks it can get into its mouth. The point is, this guy produces a lot of waste. He eats things, he eats like fish whole. He doesn't eat like mice, he eats fish whole. He eats a lot, therefore, he produces a lot of waste, produces a lot of bio load. Your tank has to handle it. One of these guys is gonna take the room, the same space in terms of bio load, then probably 30 or 40 blue-green chromuses. You could put 125 blue-green chromus in my 300 in my 450 gallon tank, and it wouldn't be a big deal. They're gonna make some dent in the bio load, but not much. Nowhere near the dent that one of these groupers is going to make in your tank. So you have to be thinking about bio load. Bigger fish produce more waste. For example, even reef safe fish like this. Swallowtail angel. This is one of my favorite reef safe angel fish. This is a female spot breast or swallowtail angel. This fish gets to be about four to five inches. It produced a fair amount of waste, not as much as that grouper, but more than other fish like wrasses and blennies and things in your reef tank. So how much waste do these fish produce? Everybody loves tanks. I'm willing to bet everyone loves tanks. I have met one girl, one lady reefer. Shout out to all the lady reefers out there. She does not like tanks. It was like, what? What are you talking about? How can you not like tanks? How can you be in the saltwater tank hobby and not like tanks? She did not like tanks, but I'm willing to bet that most of you like tanks. You would love to have multiple tanks, like in this picture, in your tank. Tanks add a lot to your bio load. They produce a fair amount of waste. So one tank is gonna take the place of many fish. So as you're looking at your fish, if it produces a lot of waste, and you can really tell that by just looking at their size and knowing some about what I've taught you tonight about certain types of fish produce more waste. If you're going to have a lot of heavy bio load fish, you're going to have to ratchet down somewhere else. It's a give and a take with your strategy. If you like a lot of tanks, that's fine. Different strokes for different folks. At the end of the day, it's your tank. But if you have a lot of them, then you're going to have less of something else. Predator fish are dirty eaters, whether that be a grouper, a lionfish, eels, things like that. They produce, they predict, they make a lot of waste. And when they eat, they eat something. Part of that something goes flying out their gills. They produce a lot of waste. They're dirty eaters. Tangs, lack of a better word, they poop a lot. They produce a lot of waste. And some fish just need to be fed a lot. I'll talk about feeding fish a little later on this evening. But if you're putting a lot of energy in your tank in the form of food, it has to get out somehow. And if you have fish that need to be fed a lot, then every time you feed them, hopefully multiple times during the day, you're adding more energy into your system. All right, again, this might work in theory. If you just follow the inch per gallon rule, per se, it would work, but in real life, it wouldn't work. This is why in real life, this is called the real life reefing with Mr. Saltwater Tank webinar, because I can tell you in real life, this doesn't happen again. I'm here to talk to you about real life on the streets experiences. This, not so much. Okay, behavior. There's lots of variety about behavior in the saltwater tank hobby, even within a genus. For example, this are two different dotty backs, two very different behavior types. The top one is a neon dotty back. The bottom one is an orchid dotty back. 
Both of these are Donnie Max, which some people say, oh, that's a dangerous fish. Don't put that in your tank. Not true. You're here because you want to be better reefers. Certain Donnie backs can actually be good citizens. The Orca Donnie back at the bottom, very reclusive fish. Don't be uh, surprised if you put it in your tank and you don't see it for two weeks or you get a glimpse of it. They'll be very reclusive. They'll hide in the rocks. They're still likely eating. They're probably going to do well, but they're very reclusive. That's okay. The neon Donnie back, fish on top, good looking fish. I will not deny that, especially under LEDs, that blue just absolutely glows. They can be real jerks. They would probably kill the, the orca dotty back if you had them in the same tank. So just because a certain genus has a bad rap doesn't mean that that's true for every single fish. One bad apple doesn't have to spoil the whole bunch. Case in point, those mm, damsel fish. Damsel fish have a bad reputation, even with me. Mostly, I don't like damsel fish. And if you're a new saltwater tank hobbyist and you say, hey, I'm gonna cycle my tank with damsel fish, please don't do that. The 1990s and the 1980s and the 70s are over. You don't have to do that. You'll never get these little guys out of your tank. They're also probably never die. I was recently brought in to, to consult on a tank. And they had the salinity down to like 1.0005 and they had damsel fish in there that were doing just fine. So yes, damsels have a bad reputation, especially this yellow-tailed damsel. These guys overall are quite mean. They're very territorial. I've watched some headbutt fish on the reef. It was quite interesting things to see. I could hear it underwater. This guy headbutted this butterfly fish on the reef. I was like, there you go. That's why I call them damn damselfish. However, some damselfish, like the Rollins damselfish here, this is a very different behaved damselfish. Very great damsel. Now, catch before everyone goes out and buys this fish or thinks they want to buy it, you need to put this fish in last. I'll talk about stock in order in a minute. So if you want this fish, don't go do it. Don't put it in your tank until your tank is nearly stocked or really until you think you are stocked. Wait until the end. But this guy is a damsel and he's very well behaved. I had six of them in my 450 gallon tank. They had their little spot where they hung out. They didn't bother each other. They didn't bother any other fish. They would bite my hand if I got down close to them. But overall, they're a great damsel. So there's variations within the species. So you need to be thinking about that when you're looking at a fish. Tangs are another great example of this. Nearly every tang in this photo, except for my blonde mesa there in the back, the yellow tang and the purple tang here are all in the zebra sobra family. Zebra somas are not necessarily a bad genus, but they don't like each other. They don't like their own kind. Now, that being said, if you didn't know that, you might stock in a bunch of zebrasoma and you're going to miss this and then likely have aggression issues. Some of you that have some experience, you're saying, well, wait, what about adding them last? I'll get to that in a minute. Case in point, Acanthoris tanks. These guys are the meanest of the tanks. They have a bad attitude. They're ADD. I've watched them on the reef and then suddenly when I saw them on the reef, I'm like, oh, this explains why these guys are jerks because they're ADD and they're always moving around. They need a lot of room. So I don't even put them in my tanks unless a client really wants them. Powder blue, I would be more okay with, but I still know it's an Acanthoris. It's still likely gonna give me aggression issues. The Sohal tang in the upper left, the Clown tang in the lower right, people love them. I absolutely recommend that you don't have them unless you have a huge tank. We're talking a thousand gallons or more. I would put them in last and you're still rolling the dice, especially with a Clown in the lower right and the so hall in the upper left. I don't even, wouldn't even try these fish. I have a client now who wants two of them in his tank. I'm like, oh no, don't, don't do it. If you want it, I'll get it for you because it's your tank, but I would not recommend it. So then you have to have some background. You need to do some research when you're looking at a certain type of fish, know about their genus, do they have a bad rap? Certain kinds are okay, so other kinds don't like their own genus. Other ones are just narcotic and will be mean. Especially this guy. Case in point, I had this fish. I got this guy, not this one, but I did have a clown tang. It was about two inches when I got him. I got him in, I ran him through quarantine, 30 days. I put him in my tank. He was a model citizen, acted like any other tank, cruised around the tank, ate, didn't bother anyone. The day it got to be four inches long, it became a big jerk. Started running around the tank, bullying other fish, being mean, having aggression issues. 
it was a problem and that getting them out had to go into a, a fish only, a large fish only with live rock tank because it became a jerk. So there's an example. You need to know a little bit about the genus. You need to know some about their behavior, do some research and know what you're getting into when you look at them. Now, I know those of you that have some experience with tangs, you're saying, well, it's all about introduction sequence, right? I can put the tangs in last and mitigate that. Potentially, there is some truth to that. For example, if I have a client who wants a lot of tangs, I will try to have that client bring them in all at once. Case in point, I'd recently built a 450 gallon tank for a client. He loves tangs. He wanted a black tang, a gym tang, a blonde naso, uh, two yellows, and a white tail bristle tooth. Some of those fish have different attitudes than others. For example, the yellow tangs, I would put them in last, and I know that I'm gonna roll the dice a little with them. They can become jerks. However, by putting them all in together, I tell them this is the best way that we can mitigate against any issues with aggression is by putting them in the same place. Because if you put fish into a tank, first thing that happens is they're gonna run around and figure out who's boss. Someone's gonna be king, and someone's gonna be all the little peasants below him. Whenever you put a new fish in the tank, it's fun to watch the pecking order get rearranged. Someone might come in and be like, I'm king and I'm gonna prove it. Someone new might come in and be like, I don't care what you all do, I'm just terrified, I'm gonna go high. But when you put all these fish in there at once, then it's all in their territory. They have to work it out amongst themselves as opposed to someone saying, hey, this is my neighborhood, I'm gonna show you who's boss. Here's the thing, a lot of fish aren't gonna go after a tank. You put it, you have 30 anthias in your, fit, in your tank, then you put in a tang, the anthias aren't gonna go, oh yeah, let me show you who's boss. It's like, no. There's, so there's some give and take in this. There is some gray area, but yes, introduction sequence can work. And that's gonna require some patience on your part. The good news is for those of you that like to stock your tank, and I get it, you get a new tank, you're wanting to put things into it. There's not much more that's boring, as boring or more boring than a saltwater tank that's up and rolling and there's nothing to look at. You don't have any coral in it, you don't have any fish. It's like, why did I just spend all this money and spend all this effort and I got nothing in it? Hint, your spouse might be saying that they want you to get something in there quick. Some fish actually do better if you bring them in in groups. Yes, those of you that want to get your tank, your tank stocked faster, here's one great way to do it in a safe type of way. The fish will actually act better and be safer and be more comfortable if you bring them in in a group. The zebra bar dart fish, the fish in the upper left, they love to hang out in multiples of three. I don't know why it's multiples of three, but that's where they do better. So you want to bring them in together. You're looking at your tank and you say, you know what, I want six of them, get six of them, quarantine them, and then put them in your tank all at the same time. Boom, there you go. You got six new fish in your tank. You, your kids, your spouse should be happy. Antheus, here's another fish that does well in groups. Most of them, again, there's some variation in species, for example, the sunburst, the blotched, they're okay being by their own, but the liar tails, like this male here in the photo in the lower right, they like to be around the ladies. If you want to see them show off their colors and stay colored up, give them multiple ladies to try to entertain and court. Boom, there you go. You got multiple fish coming in your tank at once because Mr. Saltwater Tank said you should. This isn't true with every fish, but it is true with a lot of them. This is one great way to stock your tank faster and also add a lot of variety into your tank. All right, introduction sequence. Here's another way, again, going back to these dotty backs, people say they're bad. You can put a neon goby, sorry, the neon dotty back, that's the guy up top, the resplendent down below. You put them in together, you've got a better chance of them getting along. Both of these guys are aggressive, but if you put them in, it's all new territory. They have to figure out who's gonna be king of their little area. However, if you have someone who thinks they're king because they were there before, then you add another fish, then you can have problems. Now, there's some variety in this, there's some give and take depending on your tank size. Fish are territorial, it's amazing to see how fish act differently from a five foot tank to a seven foot tank to an eight foot tank. So people say, yes, fish are territorial. If you know that, you wanna give them plenty of room to spread out, plenty of room as in feet, not in, I've got a variety of rock work, that helps, but it's more about actual gallon size and then the length of the tank. Room to spread out. All right, this guy. Here's an example of a fish that people think are safe, but it's not necessarily safe. Talk to you about this is something that I said that I would talk to you all about. Here's the first example. 
A lot of people I've talked to actually think the Neon Dotty Back is a great fish. It is great because it's pretty, I'll give them that. So they think it's a great fish for their tank because it's small, no worries. These guys can actually wreck your tank. Don't be surprised if they kill smaller fish or fish that are similar size to them. Also docile fish, firefish, certain types of antheas, these guys could take out. So keep your head up for that. doesn't mean don't get it, just know what you're getting into. All right, one thing that I see tons of people miss that is absolutely important when I'm thinking about stocking the saltwater tank is fish utility. What is the fish gonna do for you? Yes, you want the fish to look good. Yes, you want it to swim around the tank. That's a given. But what else can this two fish do for you that may even make your life easier? Cleanup crew fish. Here's a great example. The blue-green chromis. If you have any of these in your tank, they will run around and eat anything in the water column that looks like food. You put some food in, there's gonna be big pieces of food, there's gonna be smaller pieces of food, they're going to be these micro pieces of food that a lot of fish won't eat. The blue green chromis will dart around the water column picking at anything that it thinks is food and take it out of the tank before it gets a chance to break down. Other fish like tangs, they're not going to care. They're only going to go after bigger pieces of food. But these cleanup crew fish, the blue green chromis, as an example, are a great fish that you can use for that. Also, grazers. Tangs is a big one here. Some fish are just really good at grazing around your tank, eating up algae, making your life easier because they're keeping algae down or they're helping you get rid of algae. And going back to variation of species, here's another example for you. All these tangs here in this photo are algae eaters. On the reef, they eat algae. That doesn't mean they're not gonna eat frozen when you put it in your tank, but their main diet consists and should consist of algae. However, some tangs are better at it than others. Example, bristletooth tangs, the, Ch the Cento Chetus genus. These guys are really hard workers and they don't really care about other tangs. They leave other tangs alone. Tangs usually leave them alone. They're just out there doing their own thing because of how their mouth is set up, the morphology of their mouth. They're really good at rasping algae and getting it off the rocks. Here's an overlooked fish that does really good things for cleaning up your tank in terms of keeping algae at bay, or if you have an algae outbreak, put it in your tank to help it get under control. Overlooked a lot. There's a lot of variety in these that I like. This is a Tamini tang. This is a small tang. It doesn't get very big. And they do a good job. The white-tailed bristletooth is another one that I like. Now keep this in mind. Here's the thing about an algae-eating fish. If you're giving them lots of food in the tank, with whether it be sheet algae, nori, or frozen food, don't expect them to do the work to run around the tank and clean your rocks of algae. They're simply getting fed the food that you're feeding them. It's an easier meal for them. Fish are opportunistic. They're probably not going to go down and mow down your algae. So if you want these guys to be hard algae eaters, meaning to dial back your food so that they get hungry and they want to go mow down the algae in your tank. Again, variety of your species, but this is a great utility fish. It's going to make your life easier. Sand sifters. Here's one that I love. This is a pink spot goby. Love this fish. They work the sand bin, but they don't work it too much. And they're a lot of fun to watch. They sit on this little fin here. It's like a little uh, turret to them or a, a tripod. And then you sit there and look at you with these goofy eyes. Love these guys, great little fish. However, talking about fish that can wreck your tank, here's a real life on the street example for you. The sleeper head or gold headed goby. A lot of people think this fish is great for their tank because it sifts. However, they often sift way, 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 way too much. I had a client who had one of these in his tank and it would move the sand bed back and forth from either end of his tank about three times a week and it would bury any coral in the way. It didn't matter what it was. He lost multiple corals that, left, that lived on the sand bed, even corals that were on the rocks, bottom of the rocks, because this fish would bury it. It would literally move the sand to one side of the tank. I went to see him once, I kid you not, there's nine inches of sand piled up on one side of his tank and nothing at the other. Three days later, he said the sand was all on the other side of the tank. So I like sifters, but I don't like the sleeper head or the gold headed go because they simply sift too much. And they're hard to get out of your tank as well. Good luck with that. The fish I do like besides the pink spot, that's this guy right here. That's a pink spot. Don't like the gobies. I do like the Bella goby. This is a recent find one of my clients turned me on to. There are great sifters, 
they're very good looking and they're very cool and they likely won't sift too much. They have a little bit of a flat head too. Can't really see in this photo, but they're kind of goofy looking. Kind of look at them like you're kind of a weird looking goofy fish with this big mouth. But they do a great job. They likely, they often come in a little darker than this. Still a great looking fish. It's great color, doesn't sift too much, but does sift. Keeps your sand bed looking clean. You don't have to do anything for it. All my clients don't sift their sand bed because I have fish in there to do it for them. All right, what about fish that look really great that don't cost you a bunch of money? Here you go, here's a couple great examples. The red velvet fairy wraps. This is a very hardy wrasse. They're not a lot of money. I think you can get it for like $35. They're very hardy, they eat very well. They don't bother other fish in the tank. They do jump, so if you have an open top tank, keep in mind they will jump out. Here's the fish that doesn't cost you a lot of money, but looks really, really good. Glamour without the bill. Blue green chromis. You put one of these in your tank or multiples, people are going to show up and they're gonna look at your tank and go, I like that one every single time. So their fish also, going back to the neon goby and the orchid, we talked about kind of the risk of running these fish in your tank, whether it be the orchid that could be taken out by the neon up top or another more aggressive fish. Both of these don't cost you a lot of money. They are captain bred as well, which I like, and they look really good. They add a lot of personality to your tank. All right, swimming location. Here's something that I see a lot of people miss. And when I'm looking at a reef tank, even if it's stuffed with nice corals, whether it be nice softies, nice LPS, or high-end designer SPS that are fully grown out, when I'm, I'm looking at the fish, if they're not using all the swimming area of their tank, I'm like, yeah, it's great, it's good, but it's not great. This isn't a memorable reef tank for me. I'm gonna remember a couple of the corals, but I'm not gonna remember the whole package because it's missing something. Fish mainly hang out in the bottom 75% of the tank. You can see the MP60s here. So from about that level down. Now they sometimes will come up higher because they're exploring occasionally, or if you feed, they're likely gonna come up, but mostly they hang out below all down in this level. All right, you can actually fill out your tank in that level and above, if you know what you're looking for. Let's talk about some fish to fill up the upper 25%, the zebra bar dart fish. These guys will hang out right below the surface of the water. I wouldn't be surprised if they're somehow related to flying fish. They kind of look like flying fish. They hang out right there underneath the surface. And the cool thing is at night, they all find themselves kind of a hole to sleep in, and a lot of times they'll all get in there together. That's cool. But this fish is filling out that top of your swimming uh, water, the top 25% that a lot of people miss that is usually just left empty. Now, the flip side of this is down on the sand bed. If I walk into a tank and it's got a lot of big fish, a lot of tangs, maybe some angels, even butterflies, but there's no fish to hang on the sand bed, I'm like, okay, but it's missing something. It's not that well rounded to me. Getting a fish that lives on the sand bed adds a lot of variety, not only because of their personality, but also because you're using part of your tank. You can look at your tank and you're gonna notice the big fish that are swimming out in the water column. And that's cool. Then you start looking around and you'll see fish that hang out in the rocks, like this bicolored bunny. They might swim out in the water column to eat, but mainly they hang around the rocks. So as you're looking at one of your favorite corals on the rocks, this guy can swim into view and you're like, oh, cool. I haven't seen him in a while. You're again, you're filling out all the levels of your tank to give a really well versi diversified tank in terms of your fish. I know you all spend a lot of time picking coral, making your corals as diversified as you can get them. You want to like all different types. I'm saying do the same thing with your fish, especially when it comes to swimming areas. For example, the jawfish. This is a pearly head. Uh, I think these guys a lot of times come out of Florida, which is nice for those of us in the U.S. That's a short supply chain, which I like. These guys dig a little hole for themselves. They don't go out much more than about six inches from their hole. That's super cool. This adds personality to your tank. It's not just a whole bunch of fish swimming out of the water column, because again, that to me, that leaves a lot out of the table. And sometimes these guys that hang out the bottom of the tank get themselves into trouble. For example, this was my pink spot goby versus the green carpet anemone. Um, here's a hint: if it's a healthy carpet anemone, it will lose, the fish will lose every single time. This guy touched the green carpet just even a little bit. It was a healthy carpet. It ate him. You can see the cleaner shrimp is here trying to eat um, the fish before the carpet engulfs it all. 
That was my wife's favorite fish. Needless to say, that carp and anemone did not last more than two days after that event. So fill out your water column, get fish that fill out every bit from fish that swim out of the water column, fish that swim on the top, fish that hang on the rocks, fish that hang out on the bottom. That's all part of it to make a really well diversified reef tank or fish only tank when I'm looking at. All right, fish on the fringe. Here's something that also drives me crazy. People look at a fish and they say, oh, that's reef safe with caution. But what the heck does that mean, with caution? Well, and people say reef safe, well, all I think about is corals. Well, not necessarily. These guys very likely are not going to touch your corals. They may bother your invertebrates, such as your shrimps, and your snails, and your crabs, or your starfish. Thing is, you don't know what you're going to get until you put the fish in your tank. Every animal is different. So you don't know what you're going to get until you get it there. So you're going to have to be willing to take a little bit of risk. It may go well for you. It may not. I'm going to walk through a couple of examples that did go well, but didn't go well for other people, and some that didn't even go well for me. Right here on the, the, this slide here, case in point, the two triggers on the left, that is a female and a male blue draw trigger. These guys aren't going to bother your coral. They could care less about your coral. <clears throat> they may eat your shrimp. I've never had one eat a shrimp in any of my tanks or any of my clients' tanks. I had someone who followed me for a long time. They put a male blue jaw in their tank and they instantly ate all 10 of their cleaner shrimp. There it goes, 200 bucks down the drain. It was the most expensive snack they've ever fed the fish. No way to know that until you put the fish in your tank. Case in point, the harlequin tusk. This is a fish that's got a big old pair of chompers on the front of teeth. Biggest sissy fish you've ever met. He looks mean, but they're big sissies. They will hide, they easily get scared, but they're not gonna touch your coral. They will absolutely mow down any starfish in your tank. When I put my harlequin tusk in my tank, he found all the starfish in about two days. And at one point I caught him with two, you know, two, maybe three serpent stars in his mouth. How he ate him with all those prickly spines, I don't know, but he did. So he's not gonna bother your corals. Mine actually didn't even bother hermit crabs. He didn't eat snails unless the snail happened to fall off the glass and was wiggling around, then he couldn't resist himself. So there's a lot of gray area with here, but you're not gonna know what you get until you put it in your tank. You have to be willing to take that risk. Sometimes fish change what they're interested in. For example, this is a gold flake angel. This is one of mine that I had in, a, and in my tank. Model citizen, did very well. Didn't bother a thing. When I was swapping out my 450 gallon tank, I put this gold flake in a coral holding tank in with a bunch of LPS that he had been in my 450 gallon tank in for like a year. Never bothered him in my 450 gallon tank. After about three days in that holding tank, he just decided they would go mow down all my meat corals. Needless to say, I was happy that he did it. Uh, I wasn't happy because I love the fish, but I'm happy that he did it when he was in the holding tank because then he was easy to catch and pass on to a client. So you have to be willing to take the risk. Some angels, not a risk. These will not cause a problem in your reef. Everyone's gonna look at your tank and probably think that they will, and you think you're nuts. Very reef safe angel. Ah, the old regal angel. This is one of the client's tank. Here's a fish that is very hard to keep. I actually don't really recommend them unless you really know what you're doing. They're very likely gonna mow down your zoas. Now this was in a client's holding tank. He put it there, you see all the zoas in the photo because he wanted to see what it would do. Didn't bother any zoas in the holding tank. As soon as they put it in his display tank, he decided it liked zoas and it mowed them down. Definitely a fish on the fringe. Here's another non-fish on the fringe that you can put in your tank, the pyramid butterfly. Love these. You put them in your tank, anyone who's a reef keeper can come over and think you're nuts for putting a butterfly in your tank, but they're not fish on the fringe to the extent that they're not gonna bother anything, but when someone looks at you, they're gonna think you're nuts. They're gonna think these fish are fish on the fringe, but they're really not. All right, color. I'm willing to bet you got into the saltwater tank hobby or you made the switch into saltwater from freshwater because of the color. We get all the colors of the rainbow in the saltwater tank hobby. Here's a hint, you don't get this in freshwater. Someone's gonna send me a photo of a discus. I know they look close, but they ain't a saltwater fish. All the colors of the rainbow, some fish even have no color at all. This is a black tang. Here's another underappreciated fish. People look at it in this photo and they say, it looks great. I'm not so impressed, especially when they look at it and realize it costs a thousand bucks. 
However, in the tank, it is jet black with this nice white spine. I will tell you, every time I have a black tank in a client's tank, whenever someone comes and looks at my tank, they always notice that black tank and they always notice it very, very quickly. They're always very taken by it. So even the absence of cover, absence of color can be eye-catching. Of course, here's a flag fin angel, very pretty fish, not reef safe, the hippo tang, lots of color here. You don't get this in freshwater. The blonde naso, I like these over the regular naso because of their blonde top line. You put this in your tank, you can get all kinds of splashes of color. I have multiple examples of clients choosing a fish or not choosing a fish because it's the same color as their favorite sports team, or it is the color of their least favorite sports team, so no way in hell they're going to put it in their tank. Sounds trivial, but hey, sometimes people are that into their teams, especially if you're in the uh, SEC conference down here, but not right now because unfortunately there's no sports, there's just staring at your reef tank. All right, tank type. We talked about fish only and reef tanks, but it also has to do with tank size. For example, nano tanks. Some fish do really well in nanos, but don't do so well in a large tank. Not so much that they won't thrive, but you won't see them. For example, this fish is a zebra goby, sometimes called tiger gobies. This guy is inch and a half max. Most of the time they come in about three quarters of an inch. They are tiny. You put this fish in a large tank like my 450 gallon tank, you're never going to see it. Maybe you're going to see it when you're getting some micro macro photo of your coral and he happens to run in the frame or you shoot the photo and you're processing it and you're like, oh, look, there's that fish. I haven't seen him for years. Simply get lost in this big of a tank. But a small tank like the 13 gallon Evo from Fluval, great tank. Absolutely great fish for this tank. He doesn't have a lot of places to go. You're going to get to enjoy that fish, and he's perfect because he doesn't add much bio load to this tank. Great little nano tank fish. Mandarins. Here's the thing about mandarins. It has to do with their eating habits. This is important for picking your fish as well, knowing how they eat and what they eat. Mandarins. They're the most non-committal fish in the world, period. They will look at food and have an internal debate about whether they want to eat it. Meanwhile, any other fish in your tank that isn't uh, this non-committal, in other words, pretty much everything else that you can have in your tank is going to steal and snarf the food away from the mandarin while the mandarin just decided if he actually wants to eat it. Therefore, I would actually prefer to have a mandarin in a smaller tank with this caveat. Number one, that mandarin will eat frozen or prepared foods. A lot of times these guys just live off copepods. So people used to say, well, look, I only keep a mandarin in a big tank because then you can have a stable pod population to support these guys. True and not true. I'm going to talk about that in a minute. But if these guys are eating frozen food and prepared foods, that's the only way I'll buy one. I would like to keep them in a smaller tank, like a 30-gallon tank, because then it's them and probably just them in the tank. I can feed them, and they can have an internal debate for hours, debate for hours if they actually want to eat the thing, because there's no one that's going to steal their food. So you got to know that about the fish before you buy it. <clears throat> Leopard wrasse, great fish, not the easiest keeper. My experience with these guys is that they're hard to get on to prepared foods, but once you get them on, they are voracious eaters. They'll eat anything, nori, pellets, flakes, frozen, you name it, they will eat it. However, they're also very, very athletic fish. They're fun to watch on your reef because they're cruising around, looking at stuff, picking off any kind of macro or microfauna in the tank that they can find mainly copepods. They're really good hunters. They will absolutely decimate the copepod population in your tank in no time. Case in point, if you've followed me for a while, you remember when I didn't quarantine my fish, I had, red, I had velvet breakout, I restarted my 225 gallon tank. When I did it, I sterilized everything, and then I started quarantining my fish. So that tank was up and running for about 45 days before I put any fish in it. I did see some pods in the tank, and before I put any fish in that tank, there were so many pods on the glass, you thought it was infested with fleas. There were millions of them, easily 100,000 pods in this tank. As soon as I put the leopard wrasse in that tank, the pod population was gone in about four days. I'm sure there were still some there, but they weren't teeming all over the glass. So if I put the mandarin in that tank, he might have had enough pods to support him or her, but then you put this very athletic, voracious eater in the tank, 
and it wipes out the pod population. So there's some give and take on take on what they eat, as well as how good of a hunter they are, and are they gonna outcompete fish in your tank for food? And some fish just do better when they're fed a lot. For example, this is a male, female, liar tail antheus. Love antheus. Here's the thing about antheus. Everyone says we have to feed them a lot to have them thrive. And I absolutely agree. For pretty much every antheus out there, some antheus like the bourbonius or the blotched, they're okay having one or two meals a day. However, I have seen these uh, liar tails or squama pinnis out on the reef. They're out there in the current swimming like crazy, just picking off everything that they see coming at them. Usually right at the reef crest, you got this big flow coming up the reef, all kinds of plankton and such coming up from the depth. And they're just sitting out there in schools of thousands, just bang, 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 just eating food. I watched them and I said, number one, they're expending a bunch of energy doing this, but they're just eating constantly. That's how they do well in nature. So I want to try to mimic that in the tank. Here's the caveat with that. When you put a lot of food in the tank, even if you put a small amount of food in the tank, Frequently, it's going to add to your bio load. Now, hopefully you've spent some time designing your system well, you have good filtration, you haven't skimped on the right skimmer that actually skims and performs well, because that helps you manage those bio load. However, if you're gonna put antheus in your tank, if you're someone who works at home and you can feed frozen or even other types of food a couple of times a day, that's great, that will help them thrive. If you're someone who is never home or home only in the morning, you maybe get to feed the fish once, if you're going to go the antheus route, you're going to want to feed them pellets, and you're going to want to make sure that they will eat pellets before you put them in your tank. My experience with pellets is a lot of times if a tank has an algae problem, they're probably feeding pellets, so there's a give and a take here. Not saying don't keep them, just know what you're getting into. Know how they eat. In this case, antheus, they eat a lot. They have a fast metabolism. You need to feed them a lot. If you're feeding the fish a lot, that can add to your bio load. Therefore, you may have to dial down other fish in your tank. What about sneaky problem fish? Here are fish that people say, oh yeah, they're safe for your tank, go for it. You see they recommend it all the time, sometimes for curing things like algae in your tank, they can be real problems. For example, sailfin blennies. Yeah, these guys look kind of cool. And they can be real pain in the butts. That can actually be aggressive to other fish. They'll go out and they'll bite another fish. And they're not gonna bite them and kill them, but I've seen plenty of these guys in a tank with tanks, and the tanks have bite marks all up and down their body nearly constantly. Don't like the sailfin and the algae eating blennies. You simply just, they're too grumpy and they cause problems. So I don't put those in my tanks or my clients' tanks. Engineer gobies. Here's a fish that looks like an eel. They are pretty cool looking, I will admit that. But they're called engineer gobies for a reason. They always seem to be engineering a mess. They burrow on the rocks. And we're not just talking like, digging out a little cave. We're talking like building a tunnel underneath the rock that they can all curl up in. Very likely they're going to cause a rock fall in your tank, even if you have your rocks down on the glass from the bottom of your tank. Don't like these guys, they will absolutely wreck your tank. Flame angels. Some flame angels can be okay. This is another fish on the fringe example. I've heard plenty of them in reef tanks that are fine. They don't cause a problem. However, if you decide you need to get this fish out of your tank, Good luck. Yes, fish are easy to catch when you drain the ocean, but I'm willing to bet that most of you are not willing to drain out your tank just to get a fish, especially if you have coral in there. And it's not like when you drain the ocean, this fish is just gonna come swimming out and going, save me. He's probably gonna lock himself in a rock and potentially die. You're not just gonna get him because you pull all the water out of your tank. So uh, certainly this is a pretty fish. Show me a freshwater fish that looks better than that but they cause problems. And a lot of people just say, sure, go ahead and put it in your tank. I don't recommend that you do it. All right, here's one little guy, clown gobies. They're pretty cool. They sit in coral. They're not that easy to see. They add a lot of personality to the tank, but they're very likely going to nip at your SPS, especially the yellow guys. The yellow one seems to be the problem. Don't know why the yellows, but it seems to be the yellow clown gobies cause the problems. They can nip and destroy your SPS and they're tiny. This guy may be an inch in this photo. You're not gonna get him out of your tank. Good luck getting a little one inch fish out of a sizable reef tank. Sizable meaning 55 gallon even. You're not gonna get him out of there. Good luck. All right, here's one going back to the Sohal. People will recommend it and I cringe every time they do. 
absolutely bad attitude fish along with their uh, neighbor, their cousin, uh, their relative, the clown tang. Another one that people like to recommend will absolutely wreck your tank. And some fish just should be left behind. The Achilles tang, I've had countless clients go through half dozen of these that don't make it and just try to get one that does. To me, that's being irresponsible. Sharks, it's a very specific animal that needs a specific habitat. I'm not a fan of putting those in tanks unless it's really set up for that. Okay, I've covered a lot of material uh, in the past hour now. So where do I start? How are we gonna boil all this down? And by the way, if you have questions, I am gonna get the questions in a minute. Uh, certainly entertain your questions and we will get there. First of all, look, dream big. This is the first thing I would recommend you do. Sit down, jump online and go to your local fish store, write down every single saltwater fish that you like. Don't judge them, don't prioritize them yet. Just write them all down. Just write them down and look at them and be like, wow, that's really cool that there's that many fish in the ocean that we can keep in our tank. Here's a hint. Guys, and I'm saying guys because it's a male dominated hobby. And if there's a lady reefer out there and your spouse isn't on board, this relates to you too. But I gotta say it's guys because it's mainly dudes. If you're wanting your spouse to get into the hobby with you or be appreciative, or even for some of you have to approve your tank, take them to the local fish store, get online, look at all the pretty fish, let them choose a fish or two that they like. If it's not reef safe, you can cross that bridge when you get there. Let them look at it, get to know their taste, get them involved. That's a great easy way to get them involved. Yes, they want you to maintain the tank, but let them look and let them drink. That goes with you too. Write it all down. Just write everything down. This is the first thing I tell my clients to do when we go to stock their tank. Look, just sit down, write it all down, and then send me your list. Then we're going to start to narrow it down. Is this going to be a fish only tank or a reef tank? For most of you, it's going to be a reef. Then I'm gonna pull in this inch per gallon rule, but only as a guideline. This is purely giving me something in my head to go off of as a rough estimate, because then I'm going to get smart with it like I've talked to you here. Different types of reef tanks can actually keep different types of fish. Softy tanks, mixed reef fish, SPS dominant tanks. Some fish might mow down your softies like that regal angel I showed you earlier in the evening. I'm not gonna care about your SPS, so there's some give and take there. You gotta know about that. Then start building out your categories. Your high bio load fish, cramming your reef tank full of tangs, not what you wanna do, even though it passes the inch per gallon rule. Then start filling out your categories. Your high bio loaders, your utility fish, your glamour without the build. Picking colors, favorite colors. You wanna round out the color palette, you can do that with saltwater fish because we have more options because they're cooler anyways. Jumpers, if you have an open top tank, don't put a jumper on your tank. Maybe you have to put a mesh top on your tank, which to me totally ruins the look of an open top tank, but to each their own. Then you gotta think about introduction order. Like once you've got this narrowed down, then you have to say, do I need to put in all these tangs together? Do I need to put this tang in last? Do I have to put those damsels in last? You need to then decide your introduction order on how you're going to do that. When it comes to picking fish, when it comes to putting fish in your tank, absolutely quarantine every fish that goes in there. 30 days minimum. Don't be like me and have to go in online on YouTube and get to eat crow in front of everyone because three weeks before you had a marine velvet outbreak in your tank, someone asked you at a, at a trade show, do I quarantine fish? And I said, no, I've never had a problem with it. Why would I want to do that? Oh, look at me. Boom. Then I had a meltdown. Don't be me. Take from my experience, quarantine everything. Here's another thing about picking fish and stocking your tank. Go slower. I have seen countless tanks where clients have jammed a bunch of fish in there, in my opinion, too fast, but the tank just never seemed to do well. Whether it be it always had algae outbreaks or just didn't grow coral as well, I think there's something to be said about letting the tank get its legs underneath itself, putting some fish in, watching your nutrient levels. Very likely your nutrient levels aren't gonna rise, especially those of you with larger tanks. We're talking 225, 300, 400 gallons. You put in two tanks in your 400 gallon tank, your bio load shouldn't rise. If it does, you've got a filtration problem. But there's some kind of this internal thing that we can't measure, we can't test, but going slow seems to help my tanks. I know it's hard when you got this new tank set up, you wanna put fish in it, but put some fish in there, keep an eye on things. Don't be afraid to put in a couple of fish once a month. If you're quarantining for at least 30 days, it really shouldn't be any faster than that anyway. 
don't be afraid to go slow. Absolutely take it slow. I am a fan of that. There's always going to be a fish for you to buy. Very likely you can always find the fish you're looking for. My father always says someone will take your money. Go slow. I'm also a fan of more unique fish versus just big fish. When I go see your saltwater tank and it's just got a whole bunch of big fish in there, I'm like, okay, anyone can do that. Anyone can go pick some big fish at the fish store and put them in the tank. To me, it really doesn't impress me. The more memorable reef tank, the one that has a lot of personality and a lot of depth to me, is one that has some big fish, some small fish, some fish that swim in the top part of the water column, some fish that hang out on the rocks, some fish that are reclusive, but when you get to see them, they're really cool. Fish that hang out on the sand bed, maybe some that dig their own burrows. Look, this is all part of the mix. This is what we get to create in our tanks. Have the whole package when it comes to it. Don't just have a bunch of big fish in your tank and that's it. All right, successful fish picking and stocking your tank is about a strategy which I've talked to you about tonight is partly discipline, quarantine your fish, and the hard part is when you're done, you have to say I'm done and not put anything else in your tank. Let me tell you, I've been there multiple times. I've been there a lot of times with clients. I get it. That's hard. There's a new fish that this has been found or you've never seen before, and you're like, oh, I know I'm done, but I really want that one. I promise this will be the last fish. At some point, you just have to stop and say, I'm good. Everybody's getting along. This is it. I'm not messing with what's doing well. I'm out. I'm going to hold what I got. And responsibility. Some fish don't do well in saltwater tanks. Some fish don't do well in small tanks. Some fish don't do well in big tanks. But know what you're up against. Know what your skill level really is. But just because you've been keeping fish for 10, 20, 15 years, 30 years maybe, that doesn't necessarily mean you're more experienced reef keeper than someone who's three years into it or that you're willing to put the time into it. There's nothing wrong with saying, I like to keep that fish, but I'm not willing to do what it takes to keep it happy, to keep it healthy. It's simply not for me. Even if you have the skills, don't be afraid to say, not for me, I'm not willing to do it. And of course, those of you have been following me for a while, your tank personality, how does that fit into it? What are you willing to put into your tank? It doesn't have to be a lot for everyone. Maybe you want to put everything you got into it. That's fine, but know what your personality is toward your tank. And don't be afraid to have patience with this. Patience will pay off. You can always find the fish. You can always get someone to sell you the fish. Don't be afraid to go slow. All right, let's look at a couple quick examples here. Then I'm going to jump into your questions. <clears throat> here are just some suggested stockings for some various size tanks. 55 gallons, a lot of times I get a question of, can I put a tang in my 55 gallon tank? There's some give and take on this. Yes, assuming the tank is a longer 55. If you have a three foot 55, I would put a bristle tooth tang in there. I could be okay with that. A four foot 55 is much different than a three foot 55. So a lot of fish like to swim along the horizontal axis mainly. So if you have a longer tank, that's better for the fish. <coughs> Bristle tooth tank, not as active as other tanks, but very hard workers like I talked about earlier. They don't get real big. They're happy having their own little territory. That's a smaller tank, I'm okay in a smaller type tank. Pair of clownfish, two Bengay cardinals, two firefish. Those are guys that are gonna hang out near, near, near the rocks. Chromos are gonna hang out in the water column and be your utility fish. The pink spot goby or a bella goby pair. You can find those on live recorders, divers den. I've been seeing a lot of them recently, the bella goby pairs. Super cool. Bicolor money. There is a fish that's going to hang out on the rocks and add a lot of personality and look good as well. Flash harass here. There's lots of flash harassers, McCosker flashers, things like that. They don't get real big. You get a male with two females. He's going to flash and try to show off to those ladies. It's really cool. All right. Let's look at 120 gallon tank. A little bigger up the, the food chain here. I would put a yellow tang in a 120, and I would put it in there with a hippo. I'm okay with that. I would try to buy these fish small. I like buying small fish as opposed to buying big ones. Still put the bristle tooth because it's likely those other tangs aren't going to bother the bristle tooth, and the bristle tooth isn't going to bother the other tangs. Your peri clowns, your bengai cardinals, your firefish, more chromus than this one over the 55. Your bell and gobies, your pink spot are going to sift your sand bed, but not too much. Minus plenty is a great fish that mainly hangs out 
on the rocks, but when it swims, it swims like an eel. When it's out in the water column, so there's a unique personality fish that actually looks really good, won't cost the bank, won't break the bank as well. Feel free to get some anthias in this tank. 120 gallon tank, it's hopefully gonna have a sump in it. Skimmers around the 120 gallon range start performing much better than smaller skimmers. I'm okay putting anthias in that tank, feeding them more often to keep them happy and healthy. At the end of the day, we would all love to have a tank like this, not only just because of the corals, but because of the fish. This is a client's tank I just visited, and yeah, the corals look great. But you know what? What really struck me about this was the fish. I enjoyed all the different types of rasses he had in here. It really turned me back on the rasses. Lots of colors, lots of fish doing different things. The fish that hang on the rocks, you don't even get to see in this short clip. But that's part of the fun is because you can sit in front of your tank for maybe even hours, like I know some of you do, especially right now. I hope you are. And you start seeing things jumping out at you and adding a lot of depth to your tank, more than just someone who just jams in a bunch of big fish. To me, that really doesn't show me much about a reef tank. It doesn't really show me anything other than they're impatient and they can buy some big fish. All right, there we go. That's how I think about stocking a saltwater tank now the time is when i turn it over to you guys and gals raise your hand if you have a question i'm going to keep the questions at first just for questions about fish and stocking uh your tank just we're going to keep it on topic at first so if you if i call on you at first and you ask me a question about dosing i'm going to come back to you so don't take it personally but i just want to keep it on topic for the moment if you have a question raise your hand Make sure you unmute your microphone so I can hear you. And if you have any screaming kids in the background, I get it, but uh, give them a candy bar or something. They can always brush their teeth later. All right, let's see. Let's just pick a random person here. Uh, let's see. Oh, let's start at the, no, everyone. See, I had a last name of Callahan, so I was always picked first. There's always people at the bottom who did, you know, didn't get picked first. Uh, who has a question? Scott Mayberry. There you go. All right, Scott, I'm going to unmute you. Scott Mayberry, you're on. Fire away. Are you with us, Scott? I can't hear him. What is Mike. the best book? There is. What is the best book that you would recommend on lists, uh, suitable and husbandry books? Uh, that's a good question, Scott. Um, because I really haven't seen one about lists. There's sometimes charts that you see on websites about, um, you know, this fish is compatible with this, and it's so general that a lot of times I found that it isn't accurate. Some of that's just feel. There's plenty of books out there that um, I'm just, I need to dig that book out. I just packed up my fish room. There's a book, for example, all about tangs that you can keep in a saltwater tank. Plenty of in there that I didn't know, and there's some descriptions. Um, I'll have to find that, Scott, and get back to you. I don't remember the name of that book, and it is packed up at the moment. Um, in terms of husbandry, a lot of those books will tell you about how it's kept. Just keep in mind, a lot of those books are written by guys who, uh, ichthyologists who see those fish in the wild, but don't necessarily keep the fish in captivity. I've seen plenty of them that say, for example, that a Desjardini tang is very rare and it's not kept much in the hobby. I'm like, what? Like Desjardini tangs are pretty much a dime a dozen. You can find them anywhere. So as there's given some take in that, Scott, um, I really, I'll have to find that book. I wish I knew where it was. I don't want to take time tonight to go try to dig it out. I think I know where it is, but I'll get back to you with that. Um, all right, I'm down here in the S's. I got to unpause Simon from Canada uh, because he's on every single webinar. Thanks for your uh, support, Simon. How's everything up north? Hey, Mark. How are you doing? Can you hear me? I can. Uh, yeah, we're doing okay, actually. I just wanted to, uh, yeah, we're still on quarantine and lockdown. I'm sure you guys are as well. I just wanted to say that hopefully you guys are staying safe during this difficult time as well. Yeah, thank you. I'm. Uh, we are, and not only should you quarantine fish, but maybe now we should be quarantining ourselves as well. <laughs> I also wanted to tell you, uh, this is a little bit... Uh, late, but just congratulations on working with uh, saltwateraquarium.com. I know that bulk reef gets a lot of uh, shadows, but 
I'm sure uh, saltwatertank.com is uh, happy to have you. Oh, thank you. Well, I'm happy to have them as well. And there's uh, certainly the BRS guys have done a lot for themselves. I remember talking to Ryan uh, back when I got started, when I was asking him for sponsorship dollars for my local reef club. Uh, seeing their rise is impressive. And uh, it's fun to you know, be on kind of my side of the saltwateraquarium.com side. There's plenty to go around, um, but I am happy where I am. Uh, it's been a good good transition for me, not one that I necessarily thought I would make, but uh, among many benefits of the job, one of them is I get to build a large saltwater tank once I can actually travel again. Uh, so that'll be fun. I'll be talking to you all about stocking that tank once we get there. Let's go back to the top of the alphabet here. Any lady reefers? We asked some lady reefers I can see from your name. Don't be afraid to ask a question. All right, Brian. Brian Kurtz, uh, you're connected on the web. Brian, does it say that you have a mic, Brian? I can't unmute you. Uh, that is strange. All right, Brian, I'll try to circle back around with you. If you don't have a mic, uh, you may want to get one. Let's see, who else has a question who's up top? Ah, oh, Daniel Mancini. This sounds, uh, he's also connected via the web. Don't have a mic option for you. Daniel, you can write your question down. You can ask me a question. There we go. Um, down here as well. Oh, let me um, put this up as well. Dan wants to know where am I? Daniel, I am in uh, Franklin, Tennessee, is uh, the where I am, right here in the uh, central Tennessee, uh, central area is where I am. All right, uh, let's keep going. Let's go back down to the bottom. Oh, well, currently the last guy on the list. Tyler Hullemeyer, this is you. Tyler, I'm gonna unmute you. Make sure you got your mic on, Tyler. Tyler, you're up. What questions do you have about fish and stocking your saltwater tank? Yeah, hi, Mark. Uh, I was wondering what kind of tips or tricks you have for getting finicky eaters to eat during quarantine or post-quarantine in the display tank, such as a Moorish idol or a leopard grass. All right. So how do I get picky eaters to eat? Great question. Um, one, Tyler, the first thing I do, this is one big reason I do quarantine fish, is because quarantine is a great time for me to work with them to get them eating. A lot of those picky eaters are not necessarily aggressive fish. You put them in your display tank around these fish that are used to your routine, used to your tank. Also, they got to find out where they are in the pecking order. They may be getting bullied. Then they're likely not going to eat on top of the fact that you may be throwing them a food that they've never seen before. So by quarantining them, part of my job there is to keep diseases out of the tank. Part of my job is to get them eating number one, and then I want to get them eating what I feed. So the first thing I do, Tyler, is I ask the supplier when I can, what does this fish eat? If I'm buying it from a local fish store, I want to see it eat. If they tell you that they just fed, that's great. A fish will always eat, especially one that's healthy. Have them come back around and put whatever it is that they feed in the tank. I want to see that animal eat. Now, if you're buying a fish online, I realize you can't sit there and watch that fish eat. That's why I like to buy preconditioned fish online when I can. I buy a lot of fish from Lyme Aquarius Divers in because those fish are coming to me eating. They already have some weight on them. And you can find out what they feed. You can literally call them and say, hey, I'm buying a Morris Idol from your website. What are you feeding it? And they'll tell you. And you can purchase those foods so you have it. Now, you may want that fish on your food, but start with what it's used to, and then wean it over to your food. Quarantine is a great place to do it. Yes, I medicate and prophylactically treat my fish in quarantine, Tyler, but I get them eating before I do it. I want them eating their foods. Once they've eaten, they've eaten for a couple of days, then I start my medication. Then I start weaning them over. One thing that I found that's worked very well for getting finicky eaters to eat is one, know what they eat. For example, more shiles eat a lot of sponges in the wild. So if I can find a rock with sponges, I'll put it in the tank and let them pick at it. Let them get used to eating it. I want some weight on them. Then I'll start transitioning them over. That can be putting nori right next to the sponge. They associate the two. With leopard wrasses, and with other fish, what I'll do is I'll bring in live brine. I'll do this with a lot of live aquarium because they usually have a selection of live brine, something that I can bring in. I'll bring in the fish. I'll bring in live brine. I usually don't feed day one. Diver send fish, I will, because those fish are used to eating. 
but I'll throw in some live brine and very much a lot of times those fish will eat the live brine. Then I'll start transitioning them over. I'll start sprinkling in my frozen food with the live brine. For example, with the leopard wrasse, I'm not surprised that, that fish doesn't eat for the first five days, maybe even a week. Heck, with the leopard wrasse, I'm not even surprised if it buries itself in the sand and I don't see it for a week. This is another reason I like to buy preconditioned fish, like from the diver's den, because if it hides for a week, then I know I'm like, okay, it's got some weight on it. I don't have to worry about it eating. The last thing I'm going to do is go try to dig it out. When it comes out, then it will likely eat. It's going to take some time. For example, in my 450-gallon tank, I had two potter's wrasses. That's a type of leopard wrasse. Disclaimer, that's not an easy fish to keep. If you're new into the hobby or even an immediate hobbyist, I don't recommend it. But I got two potter's wrasses from Diver's Den. In my 450-gallon tank, they're voracious eaters. I would walk up to the tank. They would come running to the tank, ready to eat. When I tore down my tank, I put those guys in a small water box tank. It's about a 40-gallon tank. It's just them in the tank. I put sand in there so they would be comfortable. One of them I did not see for 10 days. But I was like, okay, it's a leopard wrasse. They sometimes do that. And I know that he's got plenty of weight on him. Heck, he was borderline obese. He'll be all right. The other one came out, but even though it did come out, he was very timid. I would walk in the room. He would go high. I had to dump the food in and then walk out of the room and like look around the corner. It's taken me about a month now to get them back to eating frozen food and getting them where they're not afraid of me. So there's some give and take, but live brine works really well working with them in quarantine so that they don't have anyone to compete with and then knowing what to eat works as well. Then I like feeding them high quality frozen. I like the LRS foods. I like uh, frozen mysis. Sometimes you can even get live mysis from live aquaria as well. I found fish will go after that and they'll also go after live brine. Then I can start working them over to my foods. All right, let's jump up to the top of the alphabet. We'll take a couple more fish uh, picking questions, and then we're going to go, uh, we'll open it up to general questions. We should jump into the middle here uh, of, oh, Matt. All right, Matt, you're on the web. Why can't I get, everyone who's connected on the web, it says that you can, I cannot, you don't have a microphone. So if that's you on your phone, you may need to check that you can unmute your phone um, because if you're connected via the web, it says that uh, there is no microphone for you. You can always ask a text question uh, down here and your questions as well. I'll get to those after I take the live questions. Here we go. Robert Urich, I'm going to unmute you, Robert. Have at it, Robert. You're like, you're on. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for hosting us tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. I entered in my text question, so you can disregard that. But I have a 50-gallon cube, uh, 24 by 24, 20 inches high. I've been looking at stocking it as a nano, but wanted to get your opinion, especially after the 55 gallon suggested list. And I was also thinking about, or highly leaning towards no sand bed. So okay. maybe a suggestion for filling that spot too. All right, so no, no sand bed. And then what was your first question? Sorry. And then it's a 50 gallon cube. So okay. I don't have the, you know, swimming space, as you spoke of earlier. I've been looking at it more of a nano build when stocking. Okay. All right. So that's not a bad uh, way to think of it in terms of a nano build because saltwater fish do like to swim left or right. <clears throat> that's how they're most happy. And I mean, with you got two by two cube, that's not bad. But it, the other nice thing about a cube is there's not really anywhere for them to hide. They're not gonna go tuck behind something um, and hide away. <clears throat> so it can be, you can use that to your advantage. So smaller fish that you would otherwise miss, um, that can be a good one, like some gobies or even a jawfish. Sometimes they will set up camp in the back of your rock work. But since you have a cube, there's really nowhere for them to go. There's only two feet on the back of the tank, but per se, you can't see. Assuming your cube is backed up to a wall. So you've got some options there. I would have put a tang in a two by two by two cube or two by two by 20 cube. No, I wouldn't do that. I mean, they're always kind of making right turns, which I found they wouldn't be as happy with. 
maybe a small bristle tooth, but I wouldn't be putting a zebrasoma such as a, a yellow tang or a purple tang in that tank, but certainly plenty of fairy wrasses would be happy in that tank. Chromosomes would be happy. I mean, clownfish are kind of so dumb that they don't care anyway. Going back to the Rollins damsels, three of those is all I would put in that size tank. But what about, <clears throat> the other question was about a sand bed. Um, do I like running a bare bottom tank? For me, I don't. And this is mainly personal preference. Yes, you can keep a bare bottom tank successfully. My current holding tank, where I have nearly all of my fish and whatever corals I kept from my 450 gallon is bare bottom because hopefully if everything continues to go well, I don't have to deal with it in the next couple months. It's going to come down anyway. But when I look at the bare bottom tank, I just go, you know, there's just something missing. The sand, I love the sand. I love going to the beach. Whenever I go to the beach, I see sand. So I want it in my tank. And certain fish like the jawfish are happier with the sand bed to burrow into. Leopard wrasses are certainly happier with the sand bed because that's where they sleep. That's where they seek shelter if they're scared. So if, I don't have a bare, if you have a bare bottom, you can't do that. Now, yes, you can do some cool things such as grow corals on the bottom of the tank like the Worldwide Corals guys do. Like, that's kind of cool. But to me, it's not worth it because there's fish that I want to keep. And in your case, you've got a two by two cube. You're not going to be cranking up the flow that much because you don't have to throw water eight feet down the length of a tank. So that's one place that cubes can, it can shine. You don't need as much flow because you can have more collision of flow. You don't have to worry about sand bed moving around as much. Personally, I just wouldn't do it. I know that a tank can be successful if you do it, but it's just not uh, my, just not my preference. Um, and certainly I have one now and I probably would not have one again. I only have it because that's, it's temporary. All right, Jose, uh, you are up. I'm going to unmute you. It looks like you have your microphone off. Jose, if you want to ask a question, unmute your mic. There we go. Should be with us now. Oh, are you with us, Jose? Yes, I'm here. Hey, uh, thank you for having this uh, very, very uh, useful. Uh, one question. Uh, we heard that in order to keep multiple tanks, like yellow tanks, uh, you have to have uh, odd numbers, not even numbers, like one, three, or five. Is that true? Uh, I haven't found any truth to that. Um, can you keep multiple tanks in a tank? For me, is more about what type of tanks you're keeping. Like if you had a naso, nasos don't bother other tanks. They don't really get let anyone push them around. When you get into zebra somas, especially when you get into the acanthoris guys, like the powdered browns, powdered blues, that's when you start having issues. But like an acanthoris messing with a zebra soma, yeah, I can see that. But a zebra soma messing with an acanthoris, probably not. And then there's variations within it, like a gem tang, that's a zebra soma. They don't push anyone around, but they don't take any crap from anyone either. Someone tries to push around a gem tang, they're going to be like, hey, hey, no, you don't. And they're going to put that fish in its place and then back off. They're not going to seek a fight, but they're also not going to get pushed around. So in terms of keeping odd numbers, I, I don't see any truth to that. It's more about which type of tanks you're wanting to keep and and what kind of stocking order are you wanting to keep them? Great question. Good luck with your tanks, Jose. Uh, of course, make sure you quarantine all of your animals going into your tank, especially the tanks. Some of them can be real ick magnets. With that, let's open it up to uh, general questions now, besides just the uh, fish questions. Rodney, you have a question. Turn your mic on, Rodney. There you are. All right, Rodney, what's your question? Yeah, I just want to know if you could put the list up you had for your 120 gallon tank, your list of uh, recommended fish. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right, thank you. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Hopefully that's uh, helpful to you. All right, let's see here. Who uh, who else has a question at the bottom of the alphabet? Uh, oh, look, Scott Bailey. There's another Canadian A. This is the only way we can, uh, well, per se, talk to the other side. Because uh, we're going on we're in quarantine. All right, Scott, you're on. How you doing, Mark? I'm well. How are you? Doing good. We've got the lady reefer Sandy here as well, but she's kind of shy, so I might have to ask her a question for her. Hello, Mark. Fantastic hey. presentation. It served as a wonderful date night for us in quarantine. Oh, what does the date night in quarantine look like? Assuming it's PG. <laughs> well, we enjoyed a lovely talk while we shared a steak together. 
and some amarone. <laughs> this, uh, this sounds like a pretty good quarantine party. Are we all invited? Well, oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> oh, great. Well, I'm glad to hear you're uh, suffering through quarantine. Well, you know. Um, so I have I have a question about the fish in quarantine. As you know, we unfortunately suffered a velvet uh, hit as well, and then we do have a quarantine tank. We did lose our diamond uh, uh, goby, and we were trying to introduce a new one to our 525 uh, XL reefer. Um, but our quarantine is glass bottom, and we've we've tried two in quarantine and lost them. And I'm and the other fish that are in the quarantine tank do fine. So I'm wondering if it's the lack of sand bottom. Or which fish again? Sorry, I missed that. The uh, sand sifting goby, the diamond goby. Oh, well, okay. Hope that tonight uh, you see reason, uh, a good reason not to keep them. So that can be part of it. They, they are more comfortable sifting sand. They don't necessarily need it to eat, like to thrive. They, they're going to get some organisms on the sand, but I found a lot of times those guys will eat. Um, part of it is just that's where the fish are happy. Big part of that can be collection as well. Um, I've been okay. on the reef and um, seen them collected. Luckily, I was in a part of the world in Mauritius where they collect them by net, uh, which is obviously much easier than other types of collection. So part of it may be your source. Uh, part of it may be how the animal transitions. Um, once you have it in your quarantine tank, if I can get one that's eating already, I would try to do that because um, that's going to help you. And then even putting a little bit of sand in the quarantine tank, I'm okay with that. Whenever I get my sand-loving fish, like a sifter or my leopards, I will have them in a 20 or 30, 40 gallon tank, and I'll put sand in there because I know that that's where they're happy. Now, can diseases live in sand? Yes, but they're more likely going to live on the rocks. If you're treating it, then you're going to treat the tank, you're going to treat the sand along with the fish, so I'm not concerned about it. I don't have a problem putting in fish or sand in a quarantine tank, but I really only do it when the fish, uh, when I know the fish requires it uh, to be comfortable. I don't do it because of a looks type thing um, in the quarantine tank. All right, we got some text questions here. If you have a voice question, that's fine. Keep your hand raised. I'm gonna jump over for um, some text questions. Randy wants to know what's the suggested fish list for a 90 gallon tank. Randy, it's not much different than uh, this 120. I would take out the hippo tang. I would put in the yellow tang. I'd put in the bristle tooth. Everything else you see here, I would be happy putting in a 90. Um, that would be a good mix for me. Great questions. <clears throat> Daniel also wants to know, he has uh, three blue-green chromas with one left. Uh, that always seems to happen with the chromas. I've yet to unlock why, Daniel. I have some clients who can keep chromas. No problem. They some feed them heavy, some don't. Chromus or damsels. Damsels are aggressive fish. It always seems that no matter how many you start with, no matter what types, they always whittles down to one, and then that one lives forever. So I haven't found the key to keeping multiples. Maybe once I try multiples in a thousand gallon tank, I'll find out that it's a size thing. Um, but overall, it just always ends up that way, which is such a bummer because they're so cool, but they just, it always whittles down. All right, Randy wants to know, can you put a green wolf eel in the same tank as a moray? Uh, I wouldn't, Randy, I would pick one. Those green mores, the, they can get quite large. That's a big eel uh, for anything short of a big tank. I have a 6,000 gallon project I'm working on. They want a big green moray. I'm still talking to them about that. If they want it, I'll get it for them, but those guys can be real jerks as well as it can get quite big. I would go with one. If you're looking for an eel, a moray, Randy, I would go with a zebra. Those are quite cool. They're not aggressive to people. They're really not aggressive to fish. They hide a lot, but everyone loves an eel. That's what I would want to know. So um, that's what I would go with if you're looking for an eel. All right, let's see. Let's take one more text question, then we'll jump back over to uh, live questions. Let's see, who's got some questions here? Um, 
Sorry, Simon asked a question. Oh, Simon's going to ask me a question, but I muted him too quickly. He says, what do I do if a timid or shy fish passes away when your stocking selection is done, and your tank is fully stocked, and then there are aggressive territorial fish that are already in the tank? What strategy would I recommend to restocking that timid fish? Oh, Simon, you always have great questions, Simon. Uh, maybe it's the poutine or the hockey, but there's no hockey right now. That's a bummer. All right, Simon, you've got an aggressive fish in the tank. You had a timid fish. It died. How are you going to get that timid fish back in there? A couple strategies. Some of these you may not like. One strategy is, is to temporarily remove the aggressive guys. Again, you may not like that strategy, but I found that it works. And you can remove them and put them in your sump or put them in your effusion long enough to get that timid fish in, give it a day or two, get it eating, and then put the aggressive fish back. The other thing that you can do is, that I like to do no matter what type of fish I'm putting in my tank, is use an acclimation box, or as Laura from Cans Marine, my partner in crime on the other end of the earth says, the Heidi Ho boxes. It lets the fish look at each other, say, Heidi Ho, uh, do you like me? Do I not like you? If the fish is going to be aggressive, it's not uncommon to have fish come up and try to attack the box. If that's going on, I'm like, okay, this isn't going to work. I'm going to do something about it. Sometimes what you can do is you can section off part of your reef. You can put light diffuser or egg crate there, put the aggressive fish on one side, put the timid on the other, let them look at each other, get the timid settled. It rearranges uh, the pecking order a little bit as well, rearranges territories. Then you can try to reintroduce, reintroduce them. Those are all strategies. Um, something else that I've done, Simon, if I put it as more timid fish in there or any fish and it's getting picked on, everyone's going nuts. I'll turn the lights off for a day or two. I would just flat turn off the lights. I'm not gonna make the room pitch black, but I'm gonna turn off the lights, the fish will hide, everyone tends to settle down. I'll do that up to two days, maybe even three days if I have to, turn the lights back on, they may kind of seek each other out and be like, hey, I'm the boss. All right, then they give up on it. All those are strategies for getting fish in, putting the timid guys in when you have some aggressive ones can be hard especially when it comes to eating, but that's another reason I like to quarantine them, get them eating what I'm eating so that they don't have to deal with a potential aggression issue and they have to do a certain out if they want to eat that food. <clears throat> All right, let's go back to the live questions. Let's go back to the middle of the alphabet here because you guys and gals are always overlooked. Do we have any lady reefer questions? I see some ladies and we've had one lady reefer question. We've got to have another one. We need a lady reefer. Okay, come on, ladies. Don't be shy. I know it's a boys club, but it doesn't have to be. There's plenty of friendly, some of us, and some of us are more terrified of you than you may be of us. It's not always true, but uh, let me go down to the bottom. Come on, just got a few. Yeah, at least take one lady, lady reefer question. Let's see if we have, all right, if you don't want to ask your questions, ladies, um, you can put it in the text window. I'll circle back around. Let's take uh, two more questions for the evening. All right, Rodney Harmon has a question. Rodney, I'm going to unmute you. Fire away. Unmute your mic, Rodney. Looks like you are mute. Yeah, you already got. You already got to me. I did. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, sorry about that. I have a 120 gallon uh, oh. list. Got it. Okay. We'll that point. Thanks, Rodney. All right. Let's see. Who has who else has a question right here in the middle? Lower end of the alphabet. Come on. Someone's gotta have a question. Don't be shy. We're all friends. Hey, there we go. Here's a lady reefer. Karen. Karen Edwards, you are on. I'm unmuting you, Karen. Unmute your mic and fire away. Come on. Unmute. There we go. Okay. Uh, my question is just a quick one. I have a 20 gallon tank. Is that enough room to use for a quarantine? Yes. Uh, well, so yes and no, depending on what you're going to put in it. I quarantined a lot of my fish for a long time in 20 gallon highs. Um, when I got to fish that were three inches and longer, especially tangs, then I would go for a 40 or go for a 55 to have that uh, length of swimming room. But 20 gallons is a great size for working with smaller fish. Rasses will be happy in there. Some gobies will be happy in there. Chromas don't care. Damsels don't care. 
I wouldn't put multiple benzyls like the Rollins that I talked about earlier, Karen. wouldn't put multiples of those in a 20, but 20 gallons can get you a long way. If you can do a 40 gallon breeder, you can get a little more run out of it. Um, I found that a 20 gallon works pretty well. 40 is okay. 40 works. 55 is good for tangs. Once you start getting above 55, it can get to the point where you're adding a fair amount of medication uh, to try to deal with the fish. Or if you do a water change, it gets to be a fairly sizable water change. So there's some give and take in that, but uh, a 20 gallon can work just fine. All right, last question of the evening. I got to jump over to these uh, shy people in um, the text questions. Remember, the recordings will be available. We will uh, email, put up that so you know where to find it. So if I didn't get to you or if you missed a question, you missed and came in late to the webinar, then uh, we will get, you can watch it there. All right, David wants to know, do cleanup crews, snail crabs, et cetera, count towards the one inch per gallon rule? Uh, David, the answer to that is no. Uh, do those guys add something to your bio load? Yes, because they produce waste, but it's so infinitesimally small, not something to be worried about. The only time I'd worry about crabs and cleanup crews causing nutrient issues is if you put a bunch in the tank and they died, then I'd be concerned, but they're certainly not gonna count towards the inch per gallon rule. You don't have to worry about those guys making a dent in your bio load. Hopefully, they are helping your bio load by processing fish waste or eating algae, but they're not gonna keep you from having other fish in your tank. Great question, great question, the great questions for everyone. Thanks for being with us. Uh, on the first webinar, remember we'll be back next Sunday night. If you want to throw us some questions, uh, you can do that over at sales at saltwateraquarium.com. Let us know what topics you'd like me to cover because we're undecided as of yet for next week. We're open to suggestions and certainly want this to be useful to you guys and gals. So tell us what you would like to learn about uh, and we'll add it to the list and see what makes it through the quarantining process, so to speak. I will see you next Sunday night. 8.30 Central. Stay safe, everyone. Wash your hands. Enjoy your tank while you're hopefully practicing social distancing or in quarantine. Uh, and we'll catch you next week. Bye.